Welcome back to Think Tech. It's uh, the 9 a.m. block on a given Thursday. It's uh, Community Matters, uh, but the extended community, I would say. Um, and we're talking to Sung Choi, the Assistant Dean of the School of Engineering in Holmes Hall at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And we're talking about Ukraine because that's what we think about all day. How do you build Ukraine back from the rubble? Uh, welcome to the show, Song. It's always nice to have you on. Always good to see you. Yeah. So, you know, it must, we all see Ukraine through our own eyes, I must say. You know, it's just sort of your life experience is the lens by which you see what is going on. And of course, there are common denominators, like I'm, I'm profoundly, profoundly affected by, by Ukraine because I think it affects the whole world. And, and I, I hate to see the, the human race suffer this way because it's not just the people in those bombed out buildings, it's all of us. And so um, that's why I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to talk to you about seeing it through your eyes as an engineer, seeing it through you know, the eyes of someone who builds, who organizes, um, who creates structures in which we live, work and play. Um, and I wanna know your thoughts about what they, and I mean the Ukrainians, I. I'm discounting the possibility that Russia will ever rebuild Ukraine. It will be the Ukrainians, not wood. And so when they get to the point, hopefully soon, of rebuilding all the rubble that Russia has created around them, how do they do that? How do you see the task? Well, uh, you know, rebuilding is never easy, and uh, it's going to be an extremely long process. Um, I think besides the actual physical rebuilding, they're going to have to do a lot of assessments as to the, uh, the number of lives lost, how they were lost, even, even maybe are some of the folks uh, still alive under some of the rubble. I, mean, I think that needs to be the number one task. And, you know, luckily, uh, a lot of our technologies, the non-invasive, uh, you know, sensing systems can detect life in almost all types of uh, situations and uh, a building collapsing. Uh, and, you know, we have a direct influence from that, uh, from a situation like that when we had the terror attacks in 2001. So we know what it's like. And it is never a short process. Uh, Putting back up something that's concrete, I mean, in a sense, is not difficult. You get rid of all this old stuff and you design and put up new stuff. It's time, you know, it's time consuming, it's resource consuming, but it can be done. And I, I think that is uh, one good nature about us as a human race and the way we look at. Uh, our mother nature earth is that everything kind of recycles and it replenishes, which is really thankful on our side that it does that. And, and you know, that old saying, um, time heals all, but maybe with the rebuilding, uh, a lot of the painful memories will get uh, healed up again. Uh, if I look historically, if I look historically, I look at, and you know, you and I are joking about the, uh, a numbers game about 52 years from 1970. Uh, that, that was pretty much World War I era, right? World War I and then World War II in the 40s. Uh, uh, some of the other smaller incidents like the Korean War in the 50s, the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s. You look at Japan, you look at Korea, and now you look at someplace like Vietnam. They are coming back with the physical rebuild. Uh, and, and I think that's a fantastic thing. And, and I, I think it, it's going to take time and resources, but it's not something that's inconceivable and or impossible. Well, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, in, in a funny way is that when you demolish something, as so many cities in Europe were demolished in World War II, um, when you rebuild, you have a new creativity. I don't mean that uh, war is good. I only mean that you you are forced to implement that creativity after the war is over. And 
And the product could be, instead of having a 16th century building, you have a 20th century building or a 21st century building. Yep. And some of the work you know, that has happened in some of those cities in Europe has really been extraordinary and admirable in terms of architecture, engineering, and, and urban planning in general. But I, I want to unpack uh, something you said. Uh, I'd like to go step by step. So here I arrive uh, in, in the rubble of Ukraine. And I see around me these um, you know, pretty big residential buildings and uh, institutional buildings and government buildings and medical buildings. Okay? And they're half collapsed and they're burned out. And, um, and my first reaction as a civilian here, as a non-engineer, is this, this cannot be relied on. You can't just move back in because it will break under you. And then, you know, you'll have a bad time and, and more rubble. So how do you de safely demolish a building that is 10 or 12 or 15 stories high, a residential building? And assume it's concrete and rebar, assume that. But you know, how do you how do you make that? How do you get it out of there? Well, well, well you know, you've you've seen some TV shows, uh, especially in Las Vegas, where they are demolishing old hotels to put up new, more fancier, taller hotels, and the, you you are going to have to implode some of those remaining structures. Obviously, you can't just remove them the way they are. I mean, like like the screensaver that's on my back, home tall. Uh, that that is a that's a concrete behemoth. I mean that that it, I mean we use it as a, a you know safety bunker for the state. So if if this was bombed, unless it's completely totally demolished, we would have to demolish the areas that's that hasn't been demolished. So we can get the parts moved out on trucks or whatever. And then once we've cleared everything it is probably safer to rebuild where we can make sure the ground structures are safe. And then from there, come up with all this new rebar and structure to put up new buildings. I, I, you know, I would love to salvage old buildings. I mean, you know, we see some of that at our Ford Island uh, because of the World War II incidents. And being able to salvage old buildings, especially the exterior, and then refurbishing the interior to be more modern would be the fantastic way to go because you are remembering and in, in you know incorporating historical aspects with the conveniences and the necessities of the modern aspect. But but sometimes that may not be possible. I mean, one of the best things about what Europe has done is how they maintain and uh, secure the beauty of some of the uh, older um, structures you know in that in the regions and, and I, I wish there's a way they could do that uh obviously what we see in ukraine uh it really is a travesty like i told you before um and they're not only demolishing the human nature aspect they are really demolishing the historical aspect of everything that was built up and that is really a, a sad incident of what uh, human greed, I guess, brings about. But no, I, I think we have the technologies, uh, we have the know-how, uh, and to rebuild will probably be a lot quicker than uh, many people uh, can, you know, think back historically as to what happened. Like I said, World War One, World War Two, and some of the other smaller incidents throughout the world. I think it'll be a lot quicker, but I, I think it, a lot of it's also going to depend on what are the safety nets that when it does get rebuilt, there won't be you know, additional incidents like this. Mm -hmm. um, well, what, about, think, what about that technology, Song? Um, can you unpack that technology? What kind of technology do we have now that's, that um, you know, didn't exist, say, 50 or 100 years ago? Um, in order to build quickly and build in a sustainable manner, um, you know, and, and build with a minimum of risk. Sure. Uh, you know, besides the fact that uh, material science for buildings have developed so much in the last 50 years, 
Uh, we always thought that a tall building had to have a huge base and a very small top, very similar to like pyramids, right? You need that structure to withhold and uh, hold up that structure all the way to the top. You, you look at many of the tall buildings now, they don't have that intuitive thinking that we thought was forever, right? It's you come up with better materials, you see that little sailboat like uh, hotel or residence in, uh, you know, in, in the Middle East. And you sit there, you go, how, how can a hotel this big reside on a foundation structure that's only about a tenth of that size? But th that, that's all coming from the type of materials that's creating those structures. And the other thing that people forget is besides buildings, we have these exceptionally large cruise ships, exceptionally large airplanes, exceptionally large satellites, which are all structures. And these satellite structures are now pretty much being built by robots in space. So all the automated robotic technology, all the different materials that have come to play are going to make it easier to rebuild in whichever fantasy design we decide. You know, the, the point of architecture, the aesthetic design part, and the physical, the civil engineering, engineering part are now coming together closer and closer that whatever you dream about, could become reality. And that was never the case even 10, 15 years ago, right? And then there's another technology I'd like to show you, uh, share with you. And it's something that somebody from here actually really started. There was a guy named uh, <clears throat> Alfred E. You might remember his name as well. I do. Uh, he had this thing called precast concrete, where you could literally make a two-bedroom apartment square and kind of stack it up and we actually have an example of that out at Salt Lake, where they stacked up the building. And it's like, I do not forget, maybe 15-story building. And then you look at all the uh, um, Hawaii Railroad things that's going up. All those support beams and the structures are pretty much pre-made. And they're just being put into place. And they're just moving along, moving along, moving along. So I, I really think um, once this tragedy ends, and I hope it's really soon, and they can figure out what peace is going to be, and maybe we'll have to come up with uh, new technologies that can, you know, involving force fields or something, so you can't just uh, invade. Um, you'll be able to put up that new... The new norm, okay, relatively quickly. I mean, and maybe the new norm is going to be better than the old norm. You know, I, I just hope the people that are involved in this uh, travesty is, you know, is going to be able to heal, uh, heal on an emotional and a psychological basis. Well, part of that is to build a country. Yep, <clears throat> build the country back. But yep. I, mean, I, 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 uh, I really, it is a visionary thing to talk about modular precast uh, sections for a building. Um, and I suppose what you could and should do is establish on a regional basis a, a precast concrete factory where you make this stuff in various forms. It doesn't all have to be uniform either. Um, just has to fit together. You can make this stuff and you truck it down the road uh, to this location and that location. And now it, it's economies of scale. It's, a, it's very efficient, very fast. And so you can truck a lot of these sections down the road. And as you say, with a crane, a single crane, you could build a tall building out of these sections in no time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the factory itself would be much quicker than pouring them on location. Am I right? Yeah, much, much quicker. Um, you would have a dedicated location that can be making these, like you said, the pre-designed parts, right? And, and, you know, if you're concerned, oh, but, you know, what about the immediate needs? Well, you know, the immediate needs are also kind of covered, too. We now have a technology called 3D printing. And it's not limited to a home printer system. It can be very large as well. And a lot of the temporary housing even be uh, 3D printed and put together. So during the time when they are re-establishing this uh, infrastructure for a city or the country, 
they can have temporary housing as well. And they are not only relatively cheap, they are very inexpensive. I think I think the thing was that they could get a 3D printed house for like twenty thousand dollars, and you know it's like two bedroom, whatever, whatever. So uh, if if your immediate needs are just covering and protection from the you know natural causes, hey, why not? And then from there you can move on, like you said. Hey, make different parts that can fit together. We, we maybe we do live in a Lego society now where things can be put up a lot quicker than what has always been thought of. Hmm. Well, that, that, the, the whole thing about pre, uh, about building houses um, on a, a printing basis is extraordinary. I, I've seen footage, and actually what's interesting and ironic is that the footage was of a um, technology that was developed in Russia, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, where, where you have a, a, kind of, um, a, a, a kind of a device in the middle of the house and, um, and it feeds concrete or some kind of concrete mixture out into various places. And it, uh, it telescopes out, you know, further, further away, closer and so forth. And it, it knows exactly what to do right down to where the electrical outlets are and mm -hmm. the wiring races and channels are <clears throat> so that when it's finished and in, in the case uh, that I observed, it, it was finished in less than 24 hours, a, a single family house, um, it would be complete. And all you'd have to do, if you chose to paint it, you could paint it. Um, the wiring could go in immediately. It was really re almost ready for occupancy. Uh, and it, if this could be done on a grand scale with these devices that you know shoot the concrete out to specified computer designed locations, you could build whole tracts of homes, uh, gee, in a matter of days. It's, but you, you alluded to the possibility that this was temporary. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be temporary. It could be permanent with a useful life of many decades. Yep. Um, and it could be really solid like a rock too. Yep. yep. I mean, it, it, the solutions that we come by now are pretty much what I like to use always. It's whatever we decide to take. And whatever we can daydream about, we can pretty much technologically make them come true. So they're very, very interesting in, about the times that we live in. Well, you know, the other thing about the, uh, these printed houses is that with the right kind of telescoping device, you know, to lay the concrete in a specified location, it wouldn't necessarily be limited, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to a single family house. No, uh, no. What I mean is you could have you have a telescope telescoping device that telescopes a long way <clears throat> and can build a gymnasium or a school or a hospital or some sort of institute, even a government building. Mm -hmm. And you could have uh, uh, ionic uh, columns in the front. <laughs> you, could, you could build any kind of architecture you want. After all, it's 3D printing. Uh, and furthermore, you could have more than one of these telescoping devices. So if you wanted to build this relatively large building overnight, you just put two or three of them in there and you program them. The whole thing is in the software. So mm -hmm. I suspect a lot of the larger buildings that need to be built uh, wouldn't necessarily be by you know, precast and shipping and, and assembly, but, but by, as you say, 3D printing. To me, that would be um, possibly a a, a technology that is used most for the larger structures, no? Yeah. I mean, you know, as I've talked to you over several decades on show, off the show, um, the development of technology is not long periods of time. It's, it's really snapped the fingers. So what, what, what we dream about today really will be you know, true tomorrow. So. You know, I've always said that if you can't predict the future, become an engineer and create one. And, and I think that's where we are. I mean, if, you're, if you can create it, you are in, in actuality predicting uh, what's going to happen. So. <laughs> that's the way to go. That's, that's a wonderful way to look at the world. So let me, let me uh, change to um, more, um, what do you want to call it, infrastructure things, okay. uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, gas uh, to heat and um, electrical power and broadband. So when I you know, blow up the old building you know, and I cart it away, 
somewhere down there in the first six feet or maybe 10 or 12 feet, there's going to be a whole lot of these cables and wires and gas conduits and God knows what's down there. Some of it will be old. Some of it may be live. Um, from an engineering point of view, how do you how do you replace that or use it or reuse it? Um, how do you how do you change that out as necessary to build a new a new city? So, so I, I think uh, whenever you have uh, you know devastating incidents like what's going on in Ukraine, uh, some of this stuff may not be reusable. Uh, and luckily, like the gas line, the electric lines, and all that, they but have. Don't forget the water, and water, water and storage yeah, and all that. Yeah. All that. You know, good thing is that a central point that can all be turned off, right? And that would be the first thing you would have to do. Uh, the other thing is what we are looking at with a lot of the renewable, especially the solar houses. Maybe some of these things have to become self-dependent in a way until new infrastructure like gas lines, electric lines, uh, and water lines can be re-put down. Uh, unfortunately, that probably will take and may take even longer time than some of the rebuilding. Okay, so for me to rebuild a house or an apartment uh, by itself may be a lot shorter than trying to get some of those infrastructure things connected up. Sewage is going to be sewage no, no matter what, right? Unless we have, or we go back to, things like septic tanks that can be emptied out uh, periodically, you are going to need those infrastructures to be set up. And it's not only near or around the building, it is gonna be throughout the whole city. And if you look at what's been happening with Ukraine and the bombings that have taken place, it's, it's not a localized problem, it is a whole national problem. So that is going to take a longer period of time. And that is probably gonna be something that has to be done simultaneously while some of the buildings are being brought back up for occupancy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a short process, but it'll be a quicker process than the past. And, and if we look at the fact that cities like Tokyo, Seoul, and uh, Ho Chi Minh and all these other places that have been uh, suffering from wars in the past and have rebuilt to where they are now, I don't see why any other city or country cannot. But it does require, I think, a lot of support, not only from the country that's rebuilding, but probably an international thing where they're going to need support from everyone. Uh, technologies even. Maybe we just have to uh, ship in technologies for that country to uh, re uh, rise up again and be where they are. I was uh, you know, going to ask you about technology, just as there are new technologies for constructing the structures. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, they'd also be, you know, some of these buildings are pretty old, the ones that were destroyed, mm -hmm. and some of the, uh, you know, uh, connecting infrastructure is pretty old also. So if you pull it all out and turn it all off, and you're going to put it in new, there must be some technologies that would be available now that were not available then to make it easier, more reliable, uh, long lasting, and so forth, and, and uh, possibly modular. Possibly bundled, you know, bundled infrastructure, so you could put it down in one pipe uh, instead of having multiple pipes as before. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. One hundred percent. Remember, uh, Japan was tinkering with a lot of the uh, uh, family-based, like LNG things, where they can have personalized, uh, you know, uh, fuel cell type things as well, and all this personalized solar thing. You know, everything could become very modular, as you said. Uh, and, and of course, all the older machines that were in there, maybe some of the generators or water pumps and all that, now they can be replaced by something that's a lot more efficient. I mean, you look at the refrigerators we had 20 years ago and the refrigerators that are coming out now, I think they use about maybe one quarter or one fifth of the electricity that, that was used. I mean, so, so everything's becoming more efficient. Um, we obviously are intelligent creatures and we're always coming up with something better. And to implement it, it is what we're going to have to do. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to say war is a good thing, but maybe this is an opportunity 
uh, for Ukraine to bring some of these things back up to a higher technology level. You know, I'm, I'm just hopeful that uh, they can save some of all that historical buildings and, um, you know, just art that's there. Building is art. So, uh, you know, hopefully they can do that. Yeah, that leads us to a question about that. Suppose I have a building that is a national treasure. I'm sure there are many buildings like that uh, in Europe in general and in Ukraine specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see that from some of those early um, television feeds, uh, you know, before the Russians began blowing everything to smithereens. We could see how beautiful the buildings were. So from an engineering point of view, looking at it from your lens, uh, it's a greater challenge, is it not? to take a building that's damaged, but but worth keeping from a cultural, architectural, you know, community point of view. Um, and you make a decision that you want to keep that, you want it to be in your, in your world, in your society. That's harder, well, but what are the challenges? Well, you know, one, one of the uh, advantages we have, besides the challenges, is that we have all this computer graphics and computer data. Uh, and they, we can constantly re, re project those images. So if we have the old images, then we can definitely rebuild to at least look like. So you look at some of our buildings here in Hawaii, many of them are historically preserved buildings. You can do pretty much whatever you want interior wise, but they want to make sure exterior wise, you do not put anything on, right? So if we can do that because you have existing images and you can do 3D projections in terms of like a hologram or something like that, it'll be a lot easier to rebuild something. But, you know, unfortunately it won't be the original, but at least the images and the historical value of what was done in the past can be kept alive. Yeah, that'd be wonderful to be able to do that. What a gift that would be. Yeah, really. It takes me to one thing I wanted to ask about, and that is, you know, back in the day um, when there were engineers and planners and architects in Hawaii that traveled to Asia, this would be in the 50s, the 60s, the uh -huh. 70s, and they, and they built Asia. They, they built all kinds of projects there. I'm, I'm thinking of Bell Collins, for example, but there were a lot of guys, and I'm sure you knew a lot of those guys. Uh, who were on the plane all day, every day, flying to various projects in Asia and lending our um, professional support, our engineering support, our architectural support um, to these projects, designing them and building them. Um, and I have a vision, but I wonder what your vision would be of, of Hawaii doing that again, doing that again in Ukraine. Um, things settle down, it's time to rebuild. Uh, the world is going to try to beat a path to the door. I mean, people who make refrigerators, for example, uh, take Samsung, for example. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. buy the stock because mm -hmm. I know they're going to have to, they're going to need a lot of <laughs> refrigerators yeah. and various other, you know, uh, appliances. So the question is, uh, can Hawaii participate in, in the effort to rebuild? Can it participate in the management, in the, in the design, in the engineering? And how can that do? How can that happen? Do you have a thought about how the professional um, community here could make that happen? Uh, professional community here, as well as any community anywhere in the world. Remember, one of the greatest resources that can be given to a country that's restarting is money, right? And with money, or even services, or even products, I mean, let's say Samsung decides, oh, yeah, we're going to donate uh, half a million refrigerators to Ukraine. You know, that's, a, that's an incredible start. And I'm sure a lot of other industries will follow suit. For us, we can definitely donate not only monetarily, but even our, our physical services, our, 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 our build, rebuilding capabilities, maybe some of our uh, very special rebuilding cap uh, capabilities because of the land that we live on, which is very different than many of the other places. Um, all these things and knowledge coming together will be a benefit for a, the country of Ukraine to rebuild. And you know what? What better way to do that? And and that's why I was saying at the beginning that it is going to have to be an international effort to rebuild. Obviously, the Ukrainians have to want it, and they have to have the drive to do it. And I don't see why that wouldn't exist from what's happening right now. I believe a lot of people miscalculated uh, who Ukraine wants. And 
it, with, with that type of tenacity, why would you not be able to rebuild, especially when the international community is willing to support you in whichever way they need? So, you know, the last time we had this show, or at least a couple of times ago, on my birthday in, in 2015, <laughs> I asked you about a case study. And I asked you uh, what you would say to your students at the School of Engineering. So I'd like to follow up on that now. Here we are at a time when there is obviously a huge need. There will be a huge need to rebuild a whole country of 44 million people, the second largest country in all of Europe, uh, which has been you know, essentially demolished already. So here I am, uh, either I'm applying to the School of Engineering, or I am in the School of Engineering, or I'm a graduate student in the School of Engineering. Um, and, um, and I come to you, Song Choi, and I say, you know, I've heard there's a, a need for me uh, in, in Ukraine, in Europe. Uh, and uh, although I can't give them a lot of money, I don't intend to go over there and get shot at. <laughs> um, but I want to make a contribution to, to the country, to what I believe is a, a noble effort at democracy. Um, what is your advice to me as a young engineer? You, you know, that, that is uh, an extremely tough, difficult, complex question, because it's not simply do I continue this path or is there a simple path of solution or pretty much what can I do? And that, that's, that, that's a big question mark. Um, I think number one, uh, as an engineer, the type of skills that you are going to learn, uh, whether it be after the whole incident is over, is something that is gonna be valued all the way through. Uh, as you know, and I know, engineering has become a part of everyday life. Whether you go on the road and you try to figure out why a road was built using asphalt or why it was used, uh, why it was built using cement like they do in California, and you, you have to figure out the advantages and disadvantages of both. And just that knowledge and being able to and being willing to give back. And I think that's the most important part. If you are willing to give back, uh, I, I think there is always going to be a way to give back. And, and, and yes, it is tough. Engineering is pretty hands-on. So some of the engineering may not be possible because you would have to be in the country of Ukraine to give back, whether it is uh, rebuilding afterwards or during the fact, because I have some uh, intriguing new sensor that can help them detect uh, the opposition, or uh, something that, you know, that, that can all encompass everything. I, we're, we're gonna, they're going to need, like you said, the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is not only water, heat, and electricity. It is now things like internet, because I don't know if many people even know how to communicate without the internet anymore. So there are some things that have become basic necessities, and all these basic necessities uh, are very engineering based. Yes, it's, it's science and mathematics, but it is the engineering part that is implementing these science and mathematics. And we're hoping to make it much more efficient and more accessible to everyone. I mean, even here in our state, there are some remote areas that have a very hard time getting high band uh, Wi-Fi. And hopefully we can get you know wide band internet out to everybody so they can enjoy doing this, what we're doing right now. Uh, having a conversation uh, over the internet using Zoom where everybody else can watch and chime in if they want. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, if I were a younger man, Sung Choi, <laughs> I, would, I, I would consider contacting you about this and getting into engineering so I could go and do my, my life work building a country. What a fabulous opportunity for anyone. And it seems so clear that an engineer could participate in that effort. What a wonderful opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Sung Choi, to come on the show again. I hope we can do this much sooner. Okay. We'll talk to you more. Let me know, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.